Romans, the third chapter, the 23rd verse. Be praying for me as I preach this. The 23rd verse, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Very short, very simple, and a very famous verse. That's one of the verses that is probably quoted almost as much as any other verse. John 3.16, of course, is probably the most quoted verse in the Bible, but for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I was uh, reading that, and I was thinking, uh, we're really living in a fast-paced day. And I think all of you would agree with that. We're living in a time of very rapid change. Nothing, uh, nothing has ever preceded us that where change has been taking place so rapidly. Stop and consider just a little bit, and, and in a way it's exciting to live in this century. But think back before 1900, for hundreds of years, things pretty much went on every day, year in, year out, with not a, without a lot of change. In other words, in, in, the, in the realm of travel, uh, for hundreds of years you would travel by horse or by ox cart or by wagon or maybe by sailing ship. And uh, any kind of a long distance traveling would be very tiresome and very slow and tedious. And uh, in the realm of medicine, medicine hadn't advanced very much all uh, clear up till the 19th century, or the 20th century, excuse me. They did for years and years and centuries. They didn't have anesthetic. They knew very little about the human body. They didn't know anything about sanitation. And, and even people would die from very simple uh, operations because of, uh, of uh, infection. They had no, uh, they had no antibiotics. Uh, and, but things didn't move very fast. They didn't have electric, and they didn't have electric forever since, you know, way back since the turn of the century. They didn't have the modern conveniences that we know about now, and so therefore there was, there was practically no inventions, very few inventions. But about the turn of the century, things really began to happen. There was uh, the, the generation of electricity. We had electric lights, all the electric appliances that we have now, the invention of the automobile, then the airplane. Things really begin to move. Then there was the telegraph, and then the telephone, and then there's radio, and then right on the heels of radio, there's television. And now in just that short period of time, about 90 years or less, now we're putting men up in space. We have satellites and inventions, and technology is, 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 uh, is advancing so fast that things seem to be obsolete almost before uh, they go on the market. I was talking to my brother who was a manager at the music store. And uh, he said, Jerry, he said, we quit handling keyboards because he said, by the time we got them in, got them uncrated, they were already obsolete. There were better ones already out. He said, we would get them in thinking we would make a profit, but new ones would come out right on their heels and we'd have to give these away in order to, in order to get rid of them. And, and, and we know that we're living in that time of uh, time where everything is moving moving so fast. We get on airplanes and fly around the world or get in fast-moving cars or whatever, and, and it's exciting to live during that time, and it is exciting for me because the Bible says in the last days knowledge shall increase. And so we're seeing inventions come out by the scores every day. Alan and a friend of his have just got a patent on a new form of refrigeration. In a few years, it'll make anything else that we have now completely obsolete because it operates at just a fraction of the cost as conventional uh, refrigeration or air conditioning. And these things are just coming out, and that's an exciting time to live in. But yet at the same time, as I get older, uh, you know, before I learn how to operate the VCR, <laughs> Jason drags in another one. You know, oh, hey, it's, man, now this thing's got all kinds of buttons and things. You know, and, and so, now the young people, uh, it's a computer age, and boy, they grasp it. I mean, they talk about megabytes and all that. I, you know, I'm still dealing with mosquito bites. But, you know, <laughs> you know I, I can, you understand, you know, a, a bits of, and different languages, these computers have different language and all that stuff. I don't even know where the on switch is. And I hope I never get it on because I won't know how to, what to do with it. But that's the, the day we're living in. Things are moving very rapidly. And I'm not quite ready for that yet. I guess as I get older, uh, I kind of want to just, uh, you know, go back 
in time, and I know that some of you and my cousin there are shaking her head up and down, and, and sometimes I like to go back in my mind back in the 50s when things and life was a whole lot simpler. What I liked about the 50s was if you needed a tooth pull, they could give you Novocaine, you know. I mean, they still had things to deaden pain, and you had automobiles to drive, but everybody, it was just a slower-paced life. And, uh, you know, now I just can't keep up with all of the changes. And we know that we're living in that time. And as a result of that, all of these changes is putting a lot of stress on people. As a result of that, a lot of people have high blood pressure and they're having all kinds of health problems because we don't lay back and kick our shoes off and relax like we used to because everything's go, 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 change, change, change. Things are always changing. It's changing at a very rapid rate, but praise God, I'm going to tell you about three things that never change. First of all, God never changes. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can go to the bank on that. God never changes. I don't care what the fashions are. I don't care what the whims are. God never changes, and it says there's no shadow of turning with God. He's the rock of ages, and he's always there, and you can always count on him. That doesn't mean that God doesn't work in different ways in different dispensations because that we know that he did. We know that back under the law, they had animal sacrifices and so that sort of thing, and so God changes the way he works, but God and his attributes and his character never change. God is love. He always has been love. He always will be love. God can't tolerate sin. He never could tolerate sin, and he never will be able to tolerate sin. Another thing, praise God, that has never changed is the Word of God. Amen. You see, the Word doesn't need, need to change. The Word of God is just as relevant today as it was when the Holy Spirit had the writers pin it down. It's the same. Another thing that has never changed is man. Man has never changed. In all that we've learned, we've got sophisticated. We drive cars where we used to drive buggies. But you see, the heart of man is still the same way it's been since man was created. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it? And do you know what? Man's heart is so deceitful that we don't even realize that our heart is deceiving us. But man has not changed. Man basically has not changed. He's changed his clothing. He's changed the way he travels. He's changed his lifestyle in that now we live in nice homes with air conditioning. And we have a lot of convenience that our forefathers didn't have. But I want to tell you, we still have the same problems, the same heart, the same hatred, the same jealousies, the same lust. We have the same thing that our forefathers had. And I'll tell you one thing that I like preaching the Bible is because it's always up to date. God never has to send me a memo and say, Jerry, now I want you to go to the third chapter of Luke, the fourth verse, and take that out and put this one in because things are changing. You know, and we all know this, that everything's always updated and they'll send you a new page or you buy a set of encyclopedias and they'll send you every year an update book because they find out they're wrong. You know what I'm saying? And then they're not sure they are now, but they're going to, here's what we think now. So they'll send you one of these. But the Bible never changes. It never changes. Now, I want to show you what the Apostle, pen through, uh, the Apostle Paul, through the pen, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned down. Now, see if this doesn't describe man today perfectly. If you didn't know better, you would think that Paul wrote this today or wrote it yesterday for you. Now, notice this. In the ninth verse of the same chapter, first of all, in in verse 9, he wants the Jews to understand something because, you see, the Jews were God's chosen people and the Jews were, they were deceived by their heart into thinking that just because they were God's chosen people, they were all right. 
They needed no repentance. They didn't need a Savior. They were Jews. They were very religious. And so the Apostle Paul, first of all, uh, brings to the conclusion that the Gentile world has sinned and come short of the glory of God, then turns right around and said, and we Jews are in the same boat. We also have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now notice what he says. What then? Are we better than they? No. In other words, are we better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now, now notice that he describes man in his day. Now, see, if you don't think this fits man today perfectly. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. Do people still lie to, to, to one another? Are there con artists out there today that still deceive people for gain? There was in Paul's day. Notice. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Do people still curse and blaspheme God today? Are they still bitter and full of hatred? Yes, they are. Well, now let me tell you something that happened to me just a few days ago. I was driving, going across the river bridge. A lady was behind me, went out around me, and as she went by, she said, Now, when they do that, I always go, I just do it. It's kind of, I know they're mad, but it's kind of like, oh, she knows me. She's waving. I go, hey, hey, you know. They're going to kill me one of these days for this. Now, I don't know why she was so furious with me. Now, I will admit, I drive like Mr. Magoo, all right? You know, I'm always, I go across Tulsa, and I need to get off on Utica. Guess where I am? Five lanes over this way, you know. Here I go, you know. And my wife, you know, she, boy, she's all buckled up, you know, and got her head under the dash, and, you know, uh, you know and, and, but praise God, he watches over me, <laughs> you know, and whoever's riding with me. I've never been in a serious accident. But see, people still have short fuses. They're still furious. They still curse. The human nature has not changed one bit. That's the reason the same gospel worked for people today as it did back then. Now, notice something else. Their feet are swift to shed blood. What? You mean there were murderers back then, Paul? Well, Paul, now, we've become educated now. We don't do that. We don't have that brutality today. We don't kill one another. We don't walk in quick trips and put a pistol to somebody's head and blow their brains out for $25. We just don't do that. We're more civilized. Is that true? No. It's just escalating. Crime is on the increase. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, we'd talk about people like Purdy Boy Floyd. Hey, you all remember that? I remember the older people would talk about Purdy Boy Floyd. Ooh, and I was a little kid and my knees would be knocking, you know. Because I always tell you at night when you're sitting, sometime when you're sitting out in the yard, you know, and it's dark, you know, and you scoot over a little closer to Mama, you know. And oh, yeah, boy, he'd go in, he'd rob people. Hey, you know what? He was a Sunday school teacher compared to the people today. Do you know what? What he did made the headlines. What he did today wouldn't even make the headlines. There's worse stuff goes on in Sand Springs than what he did. People are getting worse. They're swift to shed blood. Listen, you make me mad and I'll blow your brains out. Here a while back, here a while back, and, and, and thankfully I haven't heard much about it anymore unless people just quit talking about it, but... I know out in California, people be driving down the expressway. If somebody cuts them off, they take a pistol and kill them. Because now I'm going to be 15 seconds later getting to the beer parlor or wherever they're going. So I'm going to blow your brains out. They're swift to shed blood. There's no fear of God. Okay, the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. You know people they fear God? Yeah. There's no fear of God. The same thing that the Apostle Paul wrote about his generation fits our generation. Now, folks, did this thing go out? It's, it's all right, I guess. I thought maybe my mic quit. We've got a real problem. And the reason we've got a real problem is because, you see, we were created by a holy God. 
One of the, the characteristics of the holy God is that he cannot let sinful man into his presence. He cannot. You see, a lot of people think God can do anything, but God can't do anything, can't do anything or everything because he also is governed by his character. You see, one thing, God can't lie. He can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie because of his holy character. God can't look upon sin. Now, what does it mean he can't look upon sin? He can't look upon sin with favor. In other words, Wade, I don't care how good you are. I know you're the Sunday school superintendent. I know you do the best you can. But when you sin against God, he can't say, well, I'm going to let Wade get by with it. Because look at all the good stuff he God can't tolerate sin in any form or fashion. Now, the Bible says that puts us in jeopardy because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, listen, a lot of people say, I'm not scared of God. You ever heard anybody say that? That is the silliest thing I ever heard. You know why they're not, not afraid of God? They don't know who they're dealing with. You see, the Israelites said the same thing. God told Moses, said, Moses, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to tell all the people to get ready, uh, wash their clothes, sanctify themselves, because in three days I'm going to come down on Mount Sinai, and I want you to come up on Mount Sinai. And it says, that when they gather around that mountain, they'll know that I'm speaking to you and through you, and they will believe you forever. When Moses told the whole congregation of Israel, all you people get ready coming down. Oh, big deal. Yeah. All right. All right. We're going to get to see God. We're going to get to see this, this uh, old man upstairs. You know, I hate to see people use the name of God like that. The old man upstairs. Whew. Listen, that's, that's blasphemy. So here they're all ready. Boy, they're ready. But now God told Moses, said to Moses, let me tell you something. He said, I want you to put bounds around the bottom of the mountain. And he said, you tell the people, don't you come past that, that boundary. And he said, Moses, if an animal breaks through and starts to come up that mountain, he said, be sure that the people uh, shoot it, kill it with a dart, with an arrow, with a spear. He said, don't let it come up. He says, and if anybody uh, disobeys and starts up that mountain, he said, I'll have to break through and destroy you. Why? Because they're trying to approach the Holy God. So here's all the people. Oh, boy, we're going to see God today. You know, and that's the way people are today. Oh, I'm not scared of God. I had a man tell me one time, he said, but way years ago, <laughs> way back then, I was in my early 20s, he said, you know, I, Jerry, you know, he said, I think the worst thing about not being saved is you won't get to see God. I said, hey. I said, if you ain't saved... That's the last person you're going to want to see. You're not going to want to see God. Because, see, man hasn't seen God. They don't know who they're dealing with. So anyway, here's all these people. They're down there. You know, they're waiting for God to come down. And while they were there, all of a sudden, it sounded, said they heard the sound of a trumpet, and it grew louder and louder and louder. And by the way, if you want to know why there was the sounding of the trumpet, it was to marshal the angels from the four corners of the universe because they were there to be uh, to ordain or be uh, helpers in ordaining and the giving of the law, the Decalogue. So they were there. All of a sudden, here's this piercing trumpet louder and louder and louder. And it said all of a sudden the whole mountain began to quake. And it said that it, the whole top of it was on fire and smoke. And see, and because why? The presence of God came down and his feet touched the mountain. His feet touched the mountain. He says, man can't come into my presence. I'm holy God. Boy, I'll tell you what, when that little deal was over, they said, Moses, from now on, you talk to God, he tells you what to say, and you tell us, but we don't ever want to go through something like this again. And I want to tell you, folks, 
Right now you may not be saved and you might not be worried about it, but the Bible says the day is going to come when heaven and earth will, fly, will flee away. There will be no place for you to hide and you will find yourself in the presence of the glorious, bright, shining light of the, uh, of the Jehovah God and there will be no escape. And the Bible says the books will be open and every work Every word, every thought has been recorded and you will answer to him for it. And you know what else he says? He says, when that day comes, he said, I'm going to laugh when your calamity comes upon you. He said, I'll have you in derision. You'll be there trembling, screaming, everything. But he'll say, I'll laugh when that day comes. Why? Because he said, I did everything that I could. And you rejected it. Listen, he says, my tears will be turned into laughter. But do you know what? It's not going to be a laughter of joy. I believe it's going to be a laughter of frustration because, you see, God's not willing that any should perish. Amen. But it's like, I, I, there's nothing else I could do. It's a laughter of frustration. Then he'll have to tell the angels, take them, bind them, hand and foot, cast them out into outer darkness. You're dealing with a holy God. Now, see, now here's the, another problem of salvation. See, not only is God holy, He's just. Boy, now that really causes problems for me and for you. He's just. What does that mean? The character of God is such that He can't overlook your sin. He is a perfect accountant. He says every idle word, every thought, has to be answered for in the judgment. Everyone. He can't overlook it. 